<laughs> uh, Rich did his undergraduate and graduate work here, got his PhD, and after he finished his PhD in, uh, in mechanical and aerospace engineering here at Case, he stayed around for a while, did some teaching, and then went to, as the director of advanced systems at Orbital Research, which is a, uh, you know, small company uh, in Cleveland, and Rich uh, led the advanced systems group there for a number of years until he left maybe about a year and a half, two years ago, right? Uh, uh, two went and a half. to Boston and is now at uh, Draper Labs, where uh, Rich is the capability leader in the advanced control area. And so we're in the process of putting together a, memo of, a memorandum of understanding between Case and Draper and a smart energy alliance that's forming in order to begin to respond to systems level questions that are related to energy and energy related issues. And so Rich and I have been interacting over the last maybe six or seven months trying to put some ideas together of how we wanted to move forward. And uh, Rich has agreed to share with us some of his ideas on probabilistic modeling um, using uh, sort of grammatical inference. So without any further ado, Rich. Right. Thank you much, Ken. All right. Uh, the title of my talk is Probabilistic Model Construction Via Grammatical Inference. Um, so today what I'm going to go through, I'm going to cover some background um, on A, why it is you know, we're interested in this type of systems we're interested in. Um, one of the uh, main approaches uh, we're going to be involved in is symbolic dynamics. So I'm going to give a, 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 a brief uh, prescience on what that's about. So I'm going to try to get through that fairly quickly. It's just background. Um, so if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. I'm going to go through it pretty quick. Uh, and then I'm going to go into basically how we construct models um, using these tools. So let's look at a couple of applications. Uh, I work for Draper Lab, and we do a lot of stuff in the defense world. Um, one of the biggest areas of concern right now is uh, improvised explosive devices. Um, and we want to find out some things about how they work. And not just the bombs, but the networks that go and put them in place. So we start looking at what kind of things can we go and find. For instance, uh, when you do an IED attack, there's plenty of stuff that has to go on beforehand. They have to you know, build the bomb. They have to figure out what they're going to bomb. They're going to recruit people to do the bombing. They're going to rehearse. They're going to train individuals. So there's all sorts of things that go on beforehand. Um, so all right, so we've got that. Now, what kind of things can we actually look for? Uh, we've got some things like. Well, they might make a mistake, but we can also focus on some things like, well, uh, they've got to do some things. There's some things they can't accomplish their mission without actually doing. So is there some signature in that? Um, are there some things they can't control? Um, you know, somebody sees them you know, practicing and figures out what they're doing. They might not tell us, but they might tell their friends, stay away from this area. Do we see changes in the local behavior? So, what we want to now do is sort of figure out, all right, what kind of things can we observe? All right, we can look at traffic patterns. We can look at, at foot traffic. Um, so these are very complex behaviors that we're trying to characterize. And we want to figure out some ways of capturing the behavior of a large number of, of individuals uh, interacting. Another thing may be uh, cell phone communications. So this is a, one example of a large number of people interacting in a way that may reflect some activities that somebody else is doing. A little bit more direct is looking at uh, network intrusion detection. This is where you might now have some network, uh, computer network over a particular area. And then same people are generally talking to the same type of people over and over again. Um, you've got the same circadian rhythms. Uh, there may be some changes because of changes in, in mission or things like that, but day to day, you get the same type of behaviors. Now, if somebody comes in and begins to try to do some behavior, some, you know, trying to steal information, trying to take over your computers, you're going to start to see some behaviors that are different. So can we characterize the behavior of a computer network in such a way that when somebody starts doing some things we're not we're real happy about them doing, that we can tell, hey, they're in there. So as an example, we want to build what we call a normalcy model. And now this brings us to something that Ken alluded to. Uh, we're trying to figure out how to model, uh, or really how to capture the behavior of power distribution networks. And interestingly enough, this is also somewhat confounded with uh, communications networks as well. So there's a, a, another layer of, of, of complication on top of this. So 
one of the things you've got with the power distribution network is they, they make it redundant. So there's, there's you know, it's, it's, it's gridded. It's not a, uh, necessarily just a radial network, especially in the transmission area. So this leads to a couple of things. One is that there are a lot more interactions, many paths back to the same point. Uh, another thing you get into is that, well, if something changes, uh, say a, a, a branch comes down and takes that electric line, the dynamics of the entire system has now changed. Right? The topology of this grid is now completely different, so the way the, the dynamics are going to evolve on this are completely different. And it may be something along the lines of uh, uh, so much load comes on, so now all of a sudden the power going over a particular area or over a particular line gets too great. Uh, so, you know, here we have the state causes some automatic protection relay to coast. So the state can actually cause a change in the topology. The topology can change and change the state space, and the state space can change. So how do we begin to characterize something that's a so large, uh, it's got so many different types of interactions, and what we want to do is now begin to look at how we can sort of lift local behaviors up to a systems level and make sense of them. And one of the reasons this becomes really important is because there really is very little in the way of sensing on the grid. Uh, for instance, if your power goes off in your house, the only way they know is if you call. You know, so it's really a sensor poor. So they've got these sort of little points, you know, maybe at substations where they know what the power is. They'll put a phase measurement unit. So, you know, you really only have pockets of local information. Right now they build these really elaborate models to identify what the topology is. Uh, and then based on that identified model, they'll estimate what the state is. So, you know, they're really sort of bootstrapping a lot of stuff. And, and you know, what we want to do is see if there's a better way to do it. And they still have a lot of, uh, of, of problems because when things go wrong and there's so many steps in there, uh, they have a tough time figuring out when something's really going to go wrong, well, as opposed to, ah, that's not so bad. And, uh, you know, most, I don't know how many people were on here in 2003 when we had the, the blackout, is, is a prime example of uh, when something started out fairly minor and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and because they could not diagnose the fact that you know, there was going to be a series of cascading events that was going to send us over the edge. <clears throat> so. What kind of models do we need to put together for this? So the systems that we're interested in, whether the behaviors of individuals or you've got some physical system that, that can have very complex evolution of behaviors, um, it's not necessary to describe the exact position of everybody, every car. We don't have to know everything down to the final level. What we need to know is something that tells us, you know, this is okay, it's not okay. Um, gives us some idea of where the system is going. So rather than having a, a really microscopic model, uh, we want to get something that's going to have you know, more information than just, well, the average power flow over the entire grid is this. You know, that's, not, that's not enough information. So we're looking for something mesoscopic. So given a, 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 a given level that we, we need to know it, we need to be able to explain quantitatively within that level. All right, we've also got restrictions on our observation process. So that's going to basically tell us, you know, what kind of fidelity we really can model to. Um, and, you know, finally, you know, we want these things, uh, if, if in the limit, if we were able to go and keep on increasing our, our resolution, and we would basically come back to an exact model. You know, so in the limit, we want to be able to recover that. So what we want to do is identify the deterministic and possibly chaotic structure in the behavior that's going on. And we want to be able to forecast uh, what, what's going on. And, and really to be able to effectively forecast, we have to identify real mechanisms that do capture the behavior. You know, not just some curve fit. We want to capture something that really has a causal explanation of what's going on. So traditionally, when we model systems, you know, we tend to think of things either they're random, right? It's a fair coin toss. or they're completely deterministic. And you know, if you look at, at, at a lot of the approaches people take, all right, we'll take a deterministic system and we're going to tack on an error term, right? And then we, we tack on, uh, you know, on the observation, we, we tack on some more. And the nice thing about it is they're well understood. We know how to do it. So we need something in the middle. And really what we're trying to do here is, look, we want to capture some sort of statistical behavior. And we want to capture deterministic structure. And 
you know, really kind of, I think, what, what's at the heart of this approach is if it's deterministic, we use a deterministic, but if it's a coin toss, we, we actually flip a coin. You know, the best way to model a coin toss is to flip a coin. And so that's the kind of sensibility we want to bring into this. Now, uh, one of the things people always bring up when they start talking about complexity is, you know, things like entropy as a, as a metric for complexity. You know, it'll be very clear we're going to, we're going to explore this, uh, a bit more. But <clears throat> if you have a deterministic sequence, entropy is a good measure of the complexity of that deterministic sequence. If it is really random, it tells you really nothing about it. Right? It's not a measure, the lesson here is entropy is not a measure of complexity. And actually, it's in fact possible to have something that's got a good bit of statistical complexity that has almost no, has zero entropy. All right? So what we want to capture now is some type of model that's going to be able to give us both the random behaviors, all right, and it's such a thing, uh, changes in structure. Okay, maybe it's deterministic within a given safe space, but I want to be able to capture the way the structure changes. Or it may be something even a little more elaborate than that. So we'll start off with the usual suspect, uh, a system of differential equations. And we're going to assume that it's evolving on some compact subset. And we're going to say that that set that it's evolving on and the, the, uh, <coughs> the vector field F constitute a dynamical system. Now, one of the things that makes this <clears throat> One of the things we're going to want to do is we're going to want to chop this thing up in time. We're going we're to look at this thing as discrete symbols. So we're going to use Poincaré maps to disc discretize the system. And basically all we're doing here is we're going to define a plane. And every time uh, my trajectory comes through that plane, uh, I'm going to record where that point hits. So maybe that little example. But if, uh, <clears throat> you know, if this thing is evolving on a, on a compact uh, surf, uh, compact set, we can always define one of these. And, you know, in, in practice, this may work out to be no more, say, if it's transactional data, it may just be when I happen to get a transaction that I can use. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use this, this Poincaré map to basically build our return map. So rather than, you know, looking at this thing as, uh, as a, a system of ordinary differential equation, we have this mapping that we can iterate over. And the nice thing here is, is that once I've got this mapping, rather than the flow, I don't ever need to go back and get that ordinary di differential equation. So if I can come up with a way to get this, it's essentially the same. So the next thing we're going to do now is we're going to go, and this is going to lead into the symbolic dynamics here, is I want to convert this thing into something that's a little more useful and e more tractable to work with. And what we're going to do is we're going to encode that mapping into a symbolic sequence. And the way we do that is that we're going to take that plane, that, that Poincaré section that it hits, and we're going to partition it. And what we're going to do is with each cell of that partition, we're going to associate a symbol. And then every time the trajectory passes through that partition, we record the symbol that corresponds to that partition. Now, it sounds a little bit hokey, but it works. I'll go into that. So here's a pretty picture, I hope it's pretty anyways, of that Poincaré section at two subsequent moments in time. And you can see that under the action of F, I've got my trajectory goes from x naught to x1. Okay, and you can see on, at time t naught, I'm in the cell B naught, and at time t1, I'm at cell B1. Now, the trick here is to pick the partition in a useful way. And what we mean by the a useful way is we want to pick the cells so that the sequence of cells that it intersects with is going to be uniquely tied to a particular trajectory. Okay? And one of the ways we can see about doing it now, if you look at over here on the <coughs> section at time T1, I've got this section here in blue. So if I take the inverse mapping that under F and project it back on to at time zero. What we got here is that the fact that not only does x naught have to be in b naught, but it has to be in b naught and the intersection with that, in, that inverse mapping. If I can pick these cells in such a way that every time I do this and I keep back propagating that inverse transformation, I can make this intersection smaller and smaller. And in the limit, I recover a point. 
And that's what we call refinement. So this idea of picking our cells, all right, that partition, so that the dynamics actually cause that symbolic representation to refine itself, <clears throat> uh, we call that a generating partition. And if I can find a partition such that it does that, then that symbolic sequence is, and it's an infinite sequence, is exactly equivalent to the real trajectory. And the interesting thing about this is, you know, don't forget, I've drawn everything here in a plane, but this is regardless of the dimensionality of the system. So it does not matter how high dimensional the system is, I can encode it into a single trajectory, I'm sorry, a single sequence of symbols, which is one of the nice things. I'd rather work with one sequence of symbols than you know, something in Avogadro number of dimensions. Okay, so once we've got it in the sequence, now we're gonna look at things in terms of what we're calling a shift space. So we're gonna look at how that sequence evolves in time. Now you can sort of think about this in the way that I can look at this differential equation as essentially describing some exclusion law. It says that certain behaviors aren't allowable. Well, if there is a unique correspondence between the symbolic sequence and that trajectory, I would expect to have some type of exclusionary law acting on the symbols. So in the shift space, I'm going to look at all the possible symbol sequences that can occur. That's going to be my sequence space. That's the base space we're going to work in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to define this mapping, and really all this mapping is doing is it's saying that the lattice, I'm sorry, the, 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 the symbol is the ith symbol in the trajectory is some function of that overall sequence, right? So that's, that's just your projection there. And the other thing we're going to be able to do here is we're going to define a, a, a concept of distance between two different uh, sequences. And this should look very similar to the way we represent real numbers. Okay, so you can sort of think of it as I've got this sequence divided uh, in, into two, two points. I'm just sort of looking here. Uh, yeah, I think it's got, got size out of order here. Um, but we can think of this as this sequence in two, as two numbers. One is starting at the current time, the sequence that preceded it, and the sequence after. It's two numbers. So I want the sum of those numbers, right, to be small in some sense. If, it is, if, if they're the same, I would expect the sequence before that current time and the sequence after to be very close. So that's what we capture here uh, using the absolute value. So it's sequence going back. So I say that two sequences are sim similar in time as if, you know, the closer I am to the, the, you know, the current time, and as I go out, I wind up with the same thing. So that allows me to define some concept of a neighborhood. And so really what we've got here is we're going to call this a cylinder. This neighborhood's an open ball. Um, and it's sort of a reference to the fact we saw that return map and we're looping back and forth. So we're going to call these neighborhoods, basically a sequence of hitting it, is a cylinder. And it's just a measure of you know, how close two things are. All right, and oh, how many years the shift map? So this cylinder is now, we talked about having the sequence space. These cylinders are going to form a basis for the sequence space. And now we're going to talk about the shift map and what this shift map is looking at is as I go forward in time, how that sequence changes, I'm going to look at the trajectory in that sequence space. And by describing that sequence space in terms of these bases of cylinders, I basically have some decomposition that I can sort of group together and say, well, I'm here. From this cylinder, I can't get to that other neighbor because it's way over there. So I can, I can start to begin to construct how these things have to interact with one another. All right, so I'm going to say that this <clears throat> base space, all right, the sequence space, and that shift operator are an equivalent dynamical system as, as, as X and F. And I'm now going to begin to try to describe this thing in terms of the way that these characters are going, or these symbols are going to shift. Now, this also says that we can further restrict this to a subshift, um, and, you know, kind of going back to that notion of there are certain physical behaviors that aren't allowable, there should be certain 
sequences of symbols, therefore, that aren't allowable. So if I only go and confine myself to looking at that set of, of, of symbols, sequences that actually evolve, that gives me a subset uh, and a subshift that I'm going to be looking at. So long story short, we can formally assign a, a relationship between some sequence and a, a, a actual trajectory. And I'm going to characterize that behavior of the overall system by shifting the symbolic sequence. And if we can figure out a way to characterize and understand that subshift, that's the same thing as being able to understand me, the overall behavior. So the study of the symbolic system is known as symbolic dynamics. Um, there's a couple of things to follow. I think they're pretty interesting. The symbolic sequences are exactly equivalent to the real trajectory. All right, that's, that's going out to infinity. And the real trajectory you now can be defined to an arbitrary precision. Now, as we sort of talked about the fact we can look at the thing as a real number, it's just like a machine word. I'm sit there and say, I'm going to look at sequences of length 20, of length 30. So I can actually characterize the behavior of some, th some, some system to an arbitrary number of, of precision. So we talked before about having something at a mesoscopic, being able to sort of adjust how much resolution we were going to look at. This is the mechanism. By looking at different sizes of sequence, different lengths of sequences, we begin to describe different resolutions. Okay, so if I've got a sequence of symbols, I think the natural way to look at these things is as a language, right? And we talked about, I already mentioned a couple times that a physical uh, a differential equation describes an exclusion principle. Well, in sequences of symbols, that is a language. And so what we want to do is actually infer the language uh, that describes the way these symbols. Now, this is a purely formal syntactic definition, these sequences don't necessarily have any physical interpretation. But we're going to take a look at these discrete symbols and try to, under, try to derive what the grammatical rules that say how they evolve. Uh, all right, so well, let's get past that. Already talk to that. So <clears throat> there's a, a ton of different languages. Going back to Uncle Noam Chomsky, he started way back, we've got Four basic ones. This is this is a, at the beginning. There are a lot more that are going to fit in here, but we're going to just just focus on, on these. Now, <clears throat> a couple of nice things. One, this is a set of languages of, and as I come down here, I'm getting increasingly powerful descriptive power in the language. Um, the other thing is that this is a nested hierarchy of languages, and that's going to be important. We're going to use that to bootstrap a little bit later on. But the important thing here is that if I get a context-free language, it has all the descriptive power of a regular language. A context-sensitive language has all the descriptive power as a context-free or a regular language. All right. Um, the other thing that's very important is that for each language, there is an automaton that corresponds, that can recognize or accept that language. And as a matter of fact, that's how they classify the language. The, the, the way these languages are classified is how much memory each of these automata require to, to process the language. So a language all right, um, is going to provide the basic tools and machinery for figuring out how to characterize a sequence. All right? The a formal language is a set of words formed from some alphabet A. So that, that alphabet A now is going to come from the labels of all those partitions that we visited. Um, in general, and this physical system is not going to allow any possible concatenation of symbols. So what we're going to focus on is figuring out which ones are actually allowed. All right, so a couple of quick definitions. Uh, the set of letters associated with the language is called the alphabet. Uh, a, finite set of string, a finite set of these symbols is called a word. Um, the empty string is epsilon, um, and the set of all possible words over an alphabet is A star, right? And that's the, called a clean star. Um, <clears throat> so if I've got some R, it's the smallest superset that contains every possible, uh, and also epsilon, the empty string. Uh, it's closed under concatenation. <clears throat> now, we're going to be dealing mostly with regular languages, but I wanted to give a little sense of, of how, as we go up in languages, we get a slightly different behavior. So regular languages allow us to concatenate 
to alternate and clean closure. And basically that means that I can say, all right, you can have R or S, uh, the clean closure. I can repeat R multiple times, all right? I can, I can do R 10 times plus S, and then I can concatenate. So I can take U and V, right after the other. All right, so when I get out of context free, now I'm gonna to begin to say, all right, I'm gonna have some more process. I'm gonna say I've got terminals and variables. And terminals are what I actually spit out, but variables, I'm gonna store intermediate results. I'm gonna use a stack. So I can sort of take in information and combine it with some rules. So I use what we call production rules now to govern how we do it. And this particular set of production rules is how you build palindromes. So I'm gonna say that my word can be either the empty string, it can be zero or a one, so the palindrome is just binary. And then the production rules I'm allowed is I can either add a zero on either side of it or I can add a one on either side of it. Those are the only legal rules. So interesting thing here, I'm using this as a variable. So if I've put some, some string in there that, that's legal under, under these production rules, I can put it in there. So that's one thing you can do with regular expressions. Now, context sensitive languages, I'm not gonna get into that here, but they allow you to actually put even more uh, <coughs> confusion, you can actually begin to put context on either side of it. You can sit there and say, if I've got some sequence here, then I apply this rule. If I've got this other sequence, then I apply this rule. So as you can see, I just have to keep track of more and more uh, information each time I go, go through this. So a corresponding automaton or machine can be viewed as a representation of the language. Now, the thing is that every machine can only recognize one language. So if I get this machine, I basically have a representation of the language. Now, there can be multiple machines that represent a language, but given a machine, there's only one language. And what I think is very interesting about this is this tells us, you know, if we sort of go through this sequence of I can represent uh, a physical system as a string of symbols, this behavior is a string of symbols, and that string of symbols can be captured, described exactly by an automaton, then I can look at physical processes as computational processes. There's something in, 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 intrinsically the same about that at some level. Um, so automata, I've been bending this term around, so another quick uh, introduction to it. Uh, it's a quintuple. It has a notion of state, all right? That's gonna be very important. That's basically what we're looking to capture in, on this one. Uh, it's got some alphabet. Um, it's got some rules that tell us how I can transition from one state to another. Um, it's generally got a start state and a final state called accepting states. Um, you can get rid of the last two and then you have what they call semi-automata. Um, <clears throat> so now what we're gonna find is the language accepted by a particular automata is the set of words that if I gave it as input to that automata would wind up in a legal accepting state. So if the machine agrees with it, I wind up in an accepting state. It's a model of what languages, what behaviors are allowable under some particular dynamics. So two examples, regular expressions are recognized by a finite state automata. Most of you have, have I'm sure, seen that. Um, <clears throat> basically, starting here at Q1, I can loop on and do R multiple times, right? There's the clean star. Um, from there, I go to, uh, you know, I made an S, I go to another state, right? Uh, I've got concatenation. Uh, T, I can loop back multiple times in Q2. If I go U to Q3, it's always gonna be followed by V, concatenation. So uh, if uh, it's the same, same language I showed before. Uh, push down stack automata is a little bit different. I'm actually going to put in a stack now. So when it takes some input, it's actually also gonna go and take a look at what's in the stack. It's gonna do its operation. It can also write back on the stack. So it's this notion of I'm going to have a variable and I can change the value of what's in that variable and manipulate that. Could we before you change that for, for yep. a bare very little brain? Uh, this system you set up with Q1, Q2, and Q3. Yes. Uh, are, are, are R and S like probabilities? Uh, R plus S has to be one. What, what I've drawn here, this is deterministic. Right. right. Okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not assigning probably, I'm saying what's illegal. Th this, is, this is a pattern recognizer is what okay. this is. So if I went in, I had something that went R once, or if I'm in Q1, I can just go to S, right? That's legal. All right, fine, this thing has no problem with it. But that means I it's changed from state Q1 to state Q2. That's true, right, okay. that's absolutely true. But it has to be, 
either in Q1, Q2, or Q3, right? Right. Okay. And I'm just going back to the book Abramson on uh, the state diagrams, how they evolve. They start, let's say, at one, and then at the end, in steady state, there's a certain probability it'll be in one, a certain probability it'll be in two, and a certain probability that it'll be in three. And that would be determined by V, U, S, and R. Right. We're, we're going to get to the probability. That's, you're anticipating where I'm going, but. Yeah. 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 Okay. D right, deterministic right. Uh, DFSA. Because I'm hanging on by my nails here. I just want to see if I'm oh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. You're, 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 you're right okay. on. Okay. So it, it, this, this really here is, it, it is nothing more than a pattern recognizer. It says that that's legal. I'm trying to back that out. And I'm also going to want to put probabilistic structure on that. Um, which. Okay. <laughs> I love See, what we, If I had I, shut up, we would have saved five minutes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I love it when I get a straight man. All right, so, you know, this is, this is a very interesting thing. In, 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 in a lot of the, uh, the probabilistic modeling tends to have very simple data structures. Computer science has a lot of very rich data structures, and, and really what we're trying to do here is fuse them. Um, and, you know, looking at that regular expression is very similar to a Markov chain model. Um, you know, most commonly you'll, you'll see things modeled that way, uh, hidden Markov models. Uh, slightly, we're doing it slightly different, uh, but very close. As a matter of fact, this is more general than a hidden Markov uh, approach. Um, so at that, at similar one, that regular expressions, those are going to manifest as, a Markov chain model would manifest as a regular expression. Now, which actual paths it would take through that, that's how we're actually going to figure out what the, that's the probabilistic structure. Now, if we've got non-stationary processes, something a little bit more elaborate, these correspond to higher order computational automata. Um, you know, in, in theory, anything can be, rep can, be, can be represented by a Turing. So um, hopefully, we, well, we can't go the whole way there. So hopefully, we can get the behaviors of interest uh, without, before getting somewhere where we can't actually infer what's going on. But the other thing is, is that even if I can't go up to the computational automata that's got enough depth to capture what's actually going on, you know, we can still approximate locally. Right? So even if you've got really exotic behaviors, there's still a chance we can come up with something pretty useful to you. So what we want to go here is there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these probabilistic models and a corresponding automata and between these automata and the regular language. So if I can go backwards, figure out what the language is, I've got the automaton, I've got a probabilistic model. Okay, clearly, you know, as Joe brought up, the fact is I did not talk about any probabilities of doing these transitions. So I need to augment the machine. And the exemplar for this is what they call the Bernoulli Turing machine, which basically we've taken the universal Turing machine and augmented it with what they call random oracle. These are sometimes called O machines or oracle machines. Um, and basically, this finite state control not only looks at the stack, but it's got this other thing sitting off the side that can inject some random order, say, hey, you switch here, you switch that. Um, and you know, a, a good physical interpretation is I've got a machine that's running fine, something breaks. You know, it's a random event, I've now caused this thing to change. Um, so uh, we've talked a little bit uh, earlier about complexity and what we mean by, uh, you know, what's a good metric for complexity. And I had said that entropy was not a good one. Um, well, I'm going to argue that there's something pretty close, um, a kolmogorov chaitin entropy, which basically we're looking there at uh, you know, computational uh, complexity, which is it is the shortest machine that would run on a universal Turing machine that will replicate the data of interest. Well, we're going to make it the shortest program that will run on a Bernoulli Turing machine that will replicate. The, the, the behavior. Um, so that's our, our new metric. We're going to actually have something a little more easy to compute that we're going to use going forward. So the process of everybody, we're calling it epsilon machine reconstruction. That epsilon's out front sort of remind you of a couple of things. One is that what we are building a model of is not a model of the underlying process. It is a model of the underlying process as viewed through a particular observation process. You change the observation process, something changes, the resolution of it changes, the epsilon, you need to get a different model. So the dynamics of the observa observation process and the underlying process are confounded. And frankly, there's no way around that. Um, 
So we want to construct a model that has predictive value. And what we're going to do is we're going to figure the minimal machine that can re replicate the behavior of interest. We talked about that hierarchy. Well, we want to use the smallest, the, the one in the lowest class, and with the least number of states. All right, some uh, you know, Occam's razor argument is essentially what we're saying here. The simplest thing is the best thing. Um, so looking at each one of those automata, each one has a notion of state and also transition to successor states. All right, so that's, that's really sort of, I think, the essence of what we're trying to capture here. And what's also important is that evolution from states may be hidden. Okay, we've got observations. They're not necessarily saying, hey, I'm in state five. Uh, so we want to be able to extract what these hidden states are from what we can observe. But again, remember, it's confounded. Um, so there's some notion of actually being able to factor out different behaviors out of this data stream. And that's what we're going to be looking at. And we're going to start at the lowest level, see if that works, go to the next level, see if that works, and so on and so on. So we're actually going to bootstrap our way up uh, this thing. So what other thing that's interesting about this is that the observations at the lower level provide the basis for constructing the next highest level of machine. So it's sort of like uh, being able to abstract. So there's going to be a, a chain of abstraction. So I'm going to look for patterns at one level. I'm going to use that to deduce what a, a, a finite state automata looks like. Then I can go and I can look at patterns and clicks in the automata and figure out what a push down attack automata is going to look like and so on and so on. All right. Um, and kind of a, we're going to step through this process. So I've generated this, this some unknown PFSA. I don't know what this thing is a priori. But what I'm going to say it's got two states. And in state one, uh, with probability one-fifth, it's going to loop back and emit a one and one. Uh, or with probability eight-fifth, oh, yeah, eight-fifths, four-fifths, <laughs> four-fifths, it's going to transition to state two. And under that, with equal probability, it can emit a two-two, a two-three, a three-two, or a three-three. State two can loop back on five-five, probability one-fifth, or with probabilities four-fifth, it can transition back to state one uh, while emitting a four-four. And so this is what I've got to work with. I've got this sequence. All right, so it's the first hundred or so. All right, so get a data stream. Let's take a look at it. All right, so I can look at ooh, all the possible ways that these, these, these symbols can be laid out. So if I've got n symbols, there are k to the n possible sequences. So then I guess there's the first, second, third. So basically the amount of storage required for this is n log k. It turns out there's a better way to store this thing in terms of histograms. So let's look at the ones that actually occur, right, and take counts of that. And now we can sort of represent which one actually showed up in that histogram. All right, so we're going to use a couple of things to help us go forward. One, we're going to say that subsequences seen at the same time somehow correspond to the same state. Okay, and this kind of goes back to looking in that sequence space. If I'm in a particular cylinder, you know, there's only a couple of neighboring cylinders I can actually go out of. So, you know, these sequences are observations of cylinders. So if I start seeing the same groupings of cylinders occurring over and over again, that's some notion of state. Okay. Um, and let's see. Uh, well, we'll go on. the first thing we're going to do is we're going to build a prefix tree. And a prefix tree, oh, should have looked at this first. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step around here. Look at a prefix tree. And what a prefix tree is is basically an overlay of every possible parse tree. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over this sequence and say I'm going to have some sliding window. I'm going to build a tree of depth three. So I've got some sliding window, and I'm going to take the first three characters, two, three, four. And so I go two. Like, and, I, and what I'm doing here is I'm keeping count of how many times I see these things. So I slide that window over, three, four, four. So I got a three, a four, a four, and I'm keeping count. Uh, four, four, two. Four, four, I'm keeping count. Uh, four, two, three, four. Oh, I'm repeating this thing. So I'm going to populate this tree over and over again. Now, I'm going to go back here. The notion of entropy is very much tied to that notion of how that tree grows. And basically, I made this comment, there's a more compact notion 
of storage by just looking at what actually occurs. Um, <clears throat> and you can work this thing out. Basically, you just count how many of these things you know, there can possibly be. You use uh, Sterling's approximation. You throw it in, and the storage required is uh, VI over N log VN. And that's, those are probabilities. Right? This is Shannon entropy. Got it back. So there's an intimate relationship between how much, how the number of nodes on that tree, how that tree is growing, and Shannon entropy. So Shannon entropy, entropy we go back, is useful for some way of telling us how we're doing. But we can generalize this a little bit. You can think of Shannon entropy as we're weighting everything according to how probable it is, right? So there's some metrical information in there. Right? Another useful one is Hartley entropy, and we're going to use this one, and I'll explain why in a second. Where if you assume that everything is equally possible, you get Hartley entropy, and that is a measure of uh, 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 the topology, essentially. It's topological. And why we're going to be using this, if you think about it, we're not trying to figure out what the complexity of the underlying process is. We're trying to minimize the complexity of our model. So from that argument, you know, keeping account, saying just because something isn't likely to be used, it's still part of the model. So sort of a maximal measure of how complex the model, we're going to be more interested in Hartley entropy. Um, and it turns out you can actually further, there's a Renyi entropy, and that allows you to sort of go between uh, the, the metrical to the topology. There's a whole whole uh, <clears throat> continuum of them. Um, it's not really important for what we're talking about here today. Um, the other thing I want to introduce is the pumping lemma. And I'm using, this is a pumping lemma for regular languages. We have also pumping lemmas for context-free languages. And we're going to use this thing a little differently than it's typically used. Um, typically, we use pumping lemmas to say if something belongs to a language class or not. But we're going to use this to help us infer some structure. And one of the things that comes out of that is that if I've got some string, uh, so well, it's probably the best way. If I've got some regular language, right, and it's represented by a finite state automata, and that finite state automata has mm, five nodes, and I have a sequence of six long, what this tells me is that well, I had to have looped, right? If I if I have only four symbols, I haven't necessarily hit everything, but if I've got more symbols and nodes, this tells me I had to have repeated. So one thing we don't have in general is some expectation that I'm going to have repeated behaviors. But what this does give us is some notion that if I've sampled it for long enough, I'm going to see behaviors over and over again. And that's what's useful about this. All right, so uh, I already showed you what the prefix tree looks like. But we're going to uh, basically define a couple of things. Uh, we're calling the uh, uh, node at the top the root node. The ones down at the bottom are the leaves. Uh, an L-level tree, that's how many transitions it takes to go from the root to the leaves. Um, and you note that I also was counting. And that's how we're going to be applying the probabilistic structure. So I keep a count, and I can use a frequentist interpretation and very quickly uh, compute what relative probabilities or the absolute probabilities are associated with occupying any particular node on that. OK, so talked about the fact that entropy is a good way of measuring uh, you know, how wide a tree is. Now, if a tree is going to exactly capture the data, at some point, I expect that tree to stop growing. And that's essentially what we talk about here, entropy rate. So you know, one of the things we want to do here, we want to make sure that our models are converging. So we need some metrics to tell us when our models are behaving in, in such a way. So what I can do is I can look at the entropy uh, of an L depth tree, subtract from that uh, the entropy observed in an L minus 1 tree, and I expect that to vanish. And I think I've got an example coming up here. Ooh. No, we didn't. Um, last one, but it turns out if I've got something that simply repeats, you can see you get, uh, you get down a certain number of levels, and the tree just stops growing. However, when you've got something like a regular expression, the tree will keep on growing without bounds. Right? Um, now that rate, as you goes down, it will begin to slow down. And so you can actually, even for regular expression, sit there and say, all right, I've got enough. I've captured enough of the behavior. I've captured 99.99% of it. So this is a way to sit there and say, how, how deep of a tree do I really need to build 
before I can say that the models I built make sense. All right, so well, that's what I just talked about, capturing the desired behavior. All right, so looking at that prefix tree, pumping lemma tells me that if I'm going to see things over and over again, this gives me the interpretation. If I see some subtree that has the same number of branches coming off with the same symbols associated with the same probability, there's some notion that these things are the same. They represent the same state. And it sort of adds another interpretation of what we mean by state. The state can be defined as some state where all the probabilities going forward are the same. So what we're going to do, we're going to define something called subtree similarity. I'm going to say that two subtrees are similar if they have the same topology and the associated probabilities are the same within some delta um, using an L1 norm. Um, and so I go back through this, this tree here, and I, I got one down here, and I go and I color, pick out which ones look the same. And it turns out I've got two states that keep popping up. I got these blue ones and these red ones. Okay, and I also get some notion of the blues how they can actually trans transition to the red and to themselves. And actually, I go on the other side of the tree, I get sort of the reverse. I see how the reds, we more on top, will transition to reds and blues. So once I've sort of pulled these things out, I've got some probabilistic model of state and how things are going to go forward when I'm in that state. And I can go and look over all these, on, all these existing these states and see how these actually transition from one to the other. And I can pull out a digraph that represents the probabilities of trans transitioning from one state to the other. And what I've got here, ran into a couple of, of things here. There's <clears throat> a little bit of you know, settling out that happens to the tree. So I went up with some, some reconstruction artifacts. Um, probably could use a little bit more data, run into some problems with the central limit theorem if you don't have enough data. Um, but long story short, you can kind of see that, you know, actually even looking there, I've got some, some, some nodes here that once they transition into these two center, it doesn't go back out. They're, they're, they're uh, me transient. Out, I mean, Rich, oh, okay. uh, uh, what's going on in four? Because at point four, I don't add up to one as to where it can go. Is it supposed to go somewhere else? I mean, the other ones do add up to one, right? Like three goes to five? No, no, it, there, 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 there are a couple of things going on. One of these things is, is the fact that the way you know, we're clustering, that, that picture I showed is a little bit uh, uh, misleading because it's possible for these things to overlap. Um, and so if you don't get enough data and if the process isn't perfectly, you know, uh, uh, perfectly uh, Markovian, you're also going to wind up with this type of behavior. But uh, it's a central, ther central theorem limit problem. I don't have enough data. Oh, okay. But, you know, it, it's if one of these. Yeah. If I had infinite data, it would, it would, it would fall right out. If you had infinite data, you wouldn't need any of this, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it, it, it is pretty close, but you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and this, this is one of the things we're, we're, we're digging into and trying to figure out exactly what the limits of this are. So, getting kind of on the hairy edge of, of, of what, what we're good at. Um, so essentially, what we see here in state one, all right, it'll go four, four and transition to state two, five, five, loop back on itself, uh, probability 0.02. Um, and then similarly over here, um, two can, trans can loop back to itself under one, one, or it will transition to one under two, 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 three, three, two, three, three. Um, it's the same, I don't know if you have to go back and remember, but this is exactly what I started off with. The other thing I wanted to sort of bring out is the fact that because they're transient nodes and I sort of know what's going on, I'm just going to get rid of them. And you know, once I'm in here, this is the behavior I'm seeing. However, I got into it, um, and out to like four decimal places, I've, I've recovered the original behavior. Um, and then now that's kind of in what you might call steady state, mm -hmm. where before it was transitioning to this state. Well, I mean, the, the system may not have been, but in terms of the observation process, the way I'm reconstructing it, that may very well be. It, it's, it, there is very much a settling out. And, you know, that, that, that tree is huge, but one of the things you can see is at the top, you can think about the very top of the tree, every possible one of these subtree behaviors is overlaid right on, you know, they're all, all confounded right there. And as you move down on the tree, they resolve more and more. So, you know, there's, there's some, 
I think some rules we can sort of figure out on, you know, how to better figure out which ones we use. Maybe we don't use, worry about the ones on the side uh, that, that tend to have a little more overlap, but I so those are some issues working on. So let's go back to Occam's razor. One of the things uh, and talk about is the fact that how did I pick what that reconstruction length was and how did I pick what size uh, subtree to use? And I'm going to point out there is a bootstrapping approach. And basically, the way this thing works is I'm going to find the simplest thing that fits the case. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with some tree, say depth three. I'm going to try a depth one subtree, see if it fits. And then I need to put some metrics together to say how complex is my model. And the metrics I'm using for this is edge complexity. Um, and that is the sum of the graph complexity, okay, which under the Hartley is just the number of nodes on that graph, and the entropy, uh, and that's the entropy of those trees associated with uh, each one of those nodes, which you can see is basically associated with the number of transitions between those nodes. So this is a combination of the number of nodes and the number of edges that I could possibly traverse between them. Um, so the smaller those things are, the better. So I start off with one, I get this machine, and you can work your way through it. It gives me the exact same behavior. So this goes back to multiple machines, can represent that behavior. I'm trying to find one that's minimal in some sense. Um, this one here came out to be the winner. Uh, and if I go to uh, a, a depth three tree, I wind up with this, which got much higher edge complexity because of all the other branching. And you know, you can sort of interpret that as the fact is that you know, if you go through here and you look, you're going to see subtrees in this one are repeated up here. So it's, it's not as economical. So on to bootstrapping, OK? Almost done here. But the idea here is once I've got this model, Right. Let, let's say it, it's not working. Every time I get a longer tree, right, I wind up with a bigger digraph. So I try a bigger, bigger tree. I get a bigger, and that digraph just, just, just keeps, keeps getting bigger. I'm never getting my minimal tree, right? This is telling me that this this regular expression doesn't work. And just like I looked at the amount of rate of entropy increase going from level one to level two, I can start at level L, figure out what complexity is of that digraph model and then look at the complexity of that digraph at level L minus 1 and compare the two. And so I can generalize that metric, sit there and say, all right, how is that digraph model converging? And if it's not converging, I can sit there and say, all right, well, I need to go up the chain to a push down stack automata. And now I'm looking for patterns of behavior on the different clicks of that group, uh, of, the, uh, of the automata. So, that's where I'm going to stop today. We haven't built the, uh, the part where we're actually figuring out how to build push down stack automata yet. I think I've got it all figured out, but we'll see when I actually build it. So the, uh, where we're looking at going forward here is a couple of things we're, we're very interested in. Is, uh, you know, one is how can we improve the clustering on the tree? That kind of goes to something you were, you were asking. Um, the other thing we want to be able to do is uh, also put in uh, a priori information. Uh, one thing we're talking about doing, you can use the Hammersley Clifford theory to apply common filters to multi resolution trees. So, we're looking to use that to build up a model of what these things should look on a tree. Um, uh, also, can look at these things have switched, by the way. That's uh, my, sub, my sub bullets have switched on the first two. So, uh, also looking at improving the clustering. So, looking at also at probabilistic clustering, sort of fuzzy fying the clustering. Um, and uh, looking at using you know, Dirichlet processes, beta processes, like the Chinese uh, restaurant process, to come up with different ways of, of, of doing the clustering. And we also want to extend the inference, uh, and particularly to go to push down automata, which will give us uh, context free languages, and then uh, uh, nested stack automata, which has a, a pumping lemma, so we can do something there, which will give us weakly context sensitive languages. And that's about as far as we can go in theory. Um, and then uh, we're doing a lot of stuff with transactional data, so we're also interested in how do we actually build this token string, this symbolic string that we built in, and then you know once we've got it, it doesn't quite work, can we retokenize it? Is there a more efficient way to do it? So those are the uh, four areas we're interested in. So anybody have any questions? First of all, let's thank the speaker.
Yes. Um, you sort of a hidden Markov model, essentially, you know, you get to a state and you flip a coin and, and you generate your symbol, then, then you flip another coin and you transition wherever. So, you know, you can sort of think of, you know, a hidden Markov model, you're getting some measurement on a state, right? You know, at T1, right? We transition to T2, you know, and then you're going to flip another coin, generate another one here. So you're getting that information. Under this framework, you're getting that coin tossing, but it's also associated with a transition, right? So it's actually tied. And you can, you know, basically, you know, with, with a loop back, multiple loop back paths, you can actually, you know, remove that. So this pen's not drawing too well, but the idea here is that uh, that additional information that, that's possible to add into that push down stack automata uh, is a little bit more general. I'm not, as the, I'm sorry, the finite uh, state automata. Okay, so, so, but in that case, wouldn't it be impossible to have a richer representation of the state? So in this case, you're just saying that, you know, you have a certain state that generates M. What if I have an HMM that conflates, you know, obviously the space space goes up, but uh, in terms of representation power, it's the same. Does that, does that make sense? You're saying you can add additional states to the Markov? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, 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 that's absolutely true. You, you know, and, and I would say you can also represent a, a push down stack automata using a finite state automata or a Markov process. You just add more states, actually, an infinite number of more states. Yeah, but yeah. um, but they, they are doing a lot of stuff with, uh, you know, infinite hidden Markov modeling, and that's absolutely right. Baum Welch, Baum Welch, uh, Viterbi algorithm. Uh, they require that you have an a priori no number of states, first of all. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. Um, and that, that's essentially what's going on with a lot of the hidden Markov, or the hidden, infinite hidden Markov model work. Exactly what they're doing using uh, Dirichlet processes to augment uh, Baum Welch. Uh, well, probably the big thing is a. I'm not. I don't have any restrictions on a priori assumptions with regards to the number of states or uh, um, transitions between them. I can do higher order Markov processes. Um, and also, what's interesting about this is that it's slightly more compact notation, and I can bootstrap up to models that have a, a lot more probabilistic. I'm sorry, a lot more descriptive power. I'm not restricted to just a hidden Markov model. And that's, that's, I think, ultimately going to be the real benefit of this. Because, you know, a lot of the stuff isn't Markov. Um, or, you know, you're going to look at things, uh, you know, evolving between different Markov models, being able to capture sort of the meta behavior. It's another thing of interest. So more descriptive power and make less assumptions a priori. Let me ask you this. Okay, I've got to bring it down to Earth a little bit here to me. But you're actually going to observe strings of data okay, right. and try to figure out whether there's a suicide bomb attack plan or try to determine whether some malfunction is already beginning to creep into that grid. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in a sense, if you go down to the simplest, just a head and tail thing, mm -hmm. if you see a string of heads and tails coming up, the idea would be, can I predict what's actually going on in the system. And let's say it isn't totally random, right? you know, because maybe the, the coin is weighted in some way. Yep. You're trying to figure out whether the, the deck is stacked from a very, in a very complex multivariable system yeah. rather than just the, the um, head tail. Uh, that's, that's exactly it. I mean, but in, in a sense, isn't this the way the brain, I mean, when you take a child right after birth, the child starts taking in yeah. <laughs> oh, the experiments. <laughs> <laughs> we had this guy, Jeff Hawkins, come and talk mm -hmm. about how the brain processes information and comes to conclusions. And basically, a person sees events going on as a child and begins to develop 
the backward algorithm that this sequence of data I'm taking means, in yep. means this. Right. And it's exactly in right. In a sense, it's it's. I mean, qualitatively, somewhat the same thing you're trying to do. To do. No, I, I think there, there's definitely a very strong connection to probabilistic learning in this. And you know, one thing we sort of talked about is this. Uh, one thing I like about this code of need is the ability to sort of take a model, abstract that model, and reason on that model. So we start with the tree as a model, right? I abstract that model, find patterns in that. I build a diagram. I abstract that model. I build the next model up. So that's on the probabilistic learning side is, is something I think is neat. But you know, you're absolutely right about sort of finding these sequences that repeat. You know, things that fire together wire together, and you can sort of interpret the the, the different subtrees that pop up is is I think very similar. And you can have error in your observations. That, that's because being and I think this is the key is is that you know we're trapped, especially as systems and control people, we're trapped into this infinite precision measurements. And when things are corrupted by noise, it makes us very upset but we find a way of modeling the noise in a way that we can handle it. But the real question here is, is that how precise does the data really need to be, be in order to be able to understand enough about the dynamics that you can say something about the behavior, both in terms of when the behavior is anomalous, when it's going in the wrong way, but then more importantly, if you have to impress some kind of control strategy Maybe you ought to just control it also on this finite state See, partition right. because maybe I don't need to be down to the infinite precision. I just need it to go over here and I don't want it to fall off the edge. And this is so, really the problem in the grid, I think. That it's whether, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. Right. I mean, particularly you start looking at, at, you know, I do a lot of stuff in the battle space and we've got this proliferation of sensors and sensor platforms and, it, you know, they're running out of bandwidth. They can't talk to everybody. And, and, and you know, with, if you want to network everything, you got the delays which are destabilizing. I mean, it's clear you're not going to be able to control these things in a centralized fashion. It's also clear from a lot of the early swarm stuff, you can't just, you know, develop low algorithms that are suddenly going to emerge the perfect behavior in every sequence. Right? So, you know, there really needs to be at what level does it make sense to interact with the different components? You know, and that's never really sort of this mesoscopic, and, and what information you really need to transmit, you know, over it. And I think sort of this information-centric view of, of, you know, how you're partitioning when you've got enough resolution are, are, are kind of things that become very important in a lot of applications coming forward. But in the same way of a system of molecules, if you have a yeah. very large, complex system, maybe there's some simple things you can gather right. like, with some confidence. Uh, well, no, actually, I'll, I'll go. I'll go a step further. I mean, you know, there's there's a branch called computational mechanics, which is if statistical mechanics is dumb things banging together, yeah. computational mechanics are smart things banging together. A lot of them, and uh, uh, Wolfram uh, has done some of the seminal work in that area. He's I think gone a little bit off the deep end since then, but he's, he's yes, a yes. smart guy, no <laughs> doubt about it. And one of the things that he pulled out was, if I were to take uh, the lowest, the simplest, just nearest neighbor rules, and a bunch of them have them. I get, I get a certain types of behaviors, you know, cellular automata. Now, if I were to go and take each one of these automata and make them push down stack automata, turns out the variety of behaviors I see are the same. And so at some point, it's, it's not the computational power inherent in one of these smart things, but it's dominated by the number of interactions and the way they can, they can interact. That becomes dominant. You know, I guess sort of, uh, you know, sort of abusing the, the analogy a little bit, sort of like, you know, if you're going to apply thermodynamics, you don't care if it's a monatomic or a diatomic gas. Right. You, you're applying the same principles. Right. Though if you went down to rarefied gas dynamics, it would be something well, very different. Purified, very different. Then things right. start to go a little nuts. Right. Yeah. 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 Law of large numbers. Well, I'll tell you about that. Uh, asymptotic equipartition principle. <laughs> or actually, ergodicity. Yeah. Yeah. Ergodic well, yeah. This recurrence properties are really important. And that's really kind of also what you're relying on is that ultimately, there is some recurrence here that you can rely on. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Any other okay. questions? Okay, Rich, thank you.